Well, hello and good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for our 2023 Community Health Education Series. My name is Zavanya Covington and I am the Community Partnership Coordinator for Faith-Based Partnerships and Senior Strategies in the Social Responsibility Department here at Baptist Health. So our topic for this month, uh, February, which is also American Heart Month, is Heart Health and Stress Management. Uh, we have a special guest speaker tonight, and I will be introducing her in just a moment. But first, I uh, would like to go over our agenda. So we will have a couple of housekeeping items that I'll be reviewing. Uh, we will have the presentation in the Q&A. And finally, we will have some brief closing announcements at the very end. So as it relates to our housekeeping items, we just have three, <laughs> um, and I would like to review those before we get started with the presentation. So first, we are recording tonight's session, and it will be made available to all of the registrants. Uh, we are also tracking attendance. So if you've invited others to view with you and they didn't have an opportunity to register before uh, right now, we first say thank you so much for spreading the word, and we just ask if you could add their names to the chat or send me an email to let me know so that we can document the count for our records. Uh, and thirdly, we will be monitoring the chat during the presentation. So feel free as the presentation is happening to uh, type your questions there and they will be addressed during the Q&A segment. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Mona Shah. Dr. Shah specialized in cardiology due to her love of analyzing and her love of detailed oriented care. To further develop her passion for treating the whole patient and educating them on the connection between their lifestyle and heart health, she became board certified in holistic medicine. Dr. Shaw's area, areas of expertise include holistic medicine, women's heart health, valve disease, heart disease prevention, and non-invasive cardiac testing. In addition to car uh, cardiology, Dr. Shaw became board set certified in integrative holistic medicine because she has seen the result of treating not only a patient's physical symptoms, but also working with them to make changes in their nutrition, stress level, and medications to improve their heart health. She also understands a patient's desire to use more nat natural vitamins and supplements in addition to traditional medications. Dr. Shaw strives to really hear her patients and help them find the root of their health issues in order to best heal their heart. So Dr. Shaw, when you are ready, you can begin. Hello. Hi everyone. Thank you, Zvanya, for that wonderful introduction. So we are going to talk tonight about how our mind is connected to our body and how it's all connected, mind, body, spirit, how there's not separate entities, um, especially affecting our physical health and specifically cardiovascular health. Savanya, so next slide. Thank you. So these are just some traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And I just want to guess this again, I am a cardiologist and this is heart health month. So I just want to go through these briefly before we dive in just this, what stress does to the body. So diabetes, if you're diabetic, especially uncontrolled diabetic, you're twice as likely to have coronary artery disease. High blood pressure is also a risk factor for coronary artery disease. Really about a third of Americans, probably probably even more now, have high blood pressure and only half really have it under control. I always recommend that patients have a blood pressure machine at home. You can get one that goes around your arm because invariably when you go to the doctor's office, it may be high, you're nervous, you're stressed out, you've been in a rush. And if it comes back high in the doctor's office, sometimes I say, well, listen, you know, I want to see what it's running at home because in my office, it might have white coat, high blood pressure, and I don't want to falsely treat you either. So if you're, if you, even if you don't have a history of high blood pressure, if you're only going to the doctor once a year, you want to just keep an eye on it once a week, even it takes like five minutes, you know, to put it around your arm, be relaxed and just keep an eye on it. So when you do go to the doctor, you can say, hey, I check my blood pressures at home and this is what it runs. It's just as always better to know because high blood pressure can be silent 
sometimes until it's gotten to really severe levels. Um, what about cholesterol? We know that having high bad cholesterol, which is the LDL, and low good cholesterol, which is HDL, is also a risk factor for heart disease. We know that um, the LDL, you know, is, is very usually genetic sometimes and also diet. So that's why doing holistic, I have a whole separate talk on diet and inflammation and, and all that stuff. But basically you want to know your numbers, make sure your doctor's checking your numbers, you know, to make sure that it's under control and, and work on the diet where you can exercise. Really only a fourth of Americans are getting the amount of exercise they need. Um, 30 minutes a day. I say, you know, give me 30 minutes. And if you can't do 30 minutes, break it up, maybe do 10 minutes. And then 10 minutes later in the day, do another 10 minutes. Everyone can find 30 minutes to work out. That's a minimum and do whatever you like. If you're really not working out, then I'll kind of take anything. Do 30 minutes of walking, do 15 minutes of walking in the morning, do 15 minutes of walking later in the day that adds up to 30. If you're progressing further than that, then increase that 30 minutes to 45 minutes, throw some weight training or resistance training in, do some cardio, cardio, I don't care what you do, whatever you enjoy, whether it's Zumba, power walking, running, swimming, but get moving. Um, you know, as we get older, that also increases our risk for heart disease. Being a male, unfortunately, increases our risk for heart disease. And smoking, of course, right? We all know that. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, is chronic stress. And we know, go ahead to the next slide. We know that chronic stress is almost equivalent to high blood pressure in causing heart disease. It oftentimes gets thrown under the rug. You know, I mean, when you go see your doctor, they're going through their meds, going through the labs, going through all that stuff. But how many times are you really addressing stress? Um, and that's why it's one of my passions to address stress and how to handle it and why and what is it doing? We know that stress is bad, but why and how and how can we manage it? That's what this whole talk is about. Um, and, you know, this was a great study. It's an old study, but it was wonderful. It looked at 13,000 patients. That's a lot of patients to be in a study over not just America, over 50 different countries. And they looked at all the different risk factors for heart disease. And they found that chronic stress, not an acute stressor, okay, not, you know, your husband just passed away, that, not that kind of thing. I'm talking about the day-to-day -day ups and downs we all go through, found that the chronic stress doubled the risk of heart disease separate from high blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes and all that. So it is definitely something that we need to address and see how we can help it. Next slide. Okay, so what, again, what do I mean by stress is, is a lot of different things. Stress is kind of a, encompasses a lot. It can be depression. Stress can mean anger. Stress can mean chronic anxiety. It's day-to-day -day stressors, you know, kids, work, spouses, neighbors, friends, you know, you name it, being a caregiver, it's that day-to-day -day stress is what I'm talking about, not the big massive stressor. Um, it's the day-to-day stuff that leads up, it takes years, a couple years, sometimes less, and we can see this big effect on a lot of different things, but again, I'm focusing on cardiovascular disease. Now, there is also a condition called stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Some of you may have heard of it. It's also called broken heart syndrome, Takosobo's cardiomyopathy. That is seen, that's a different thing than what I'm talking about. But essentially what that is, is a lot of times we see patients with a major stressor. I saw a woman in the hospital two weeks ago who had just lost her child. And she came in with what looked like a heart attack. And when we did the angiogram, she didn't have any blockages, but her heart had ballooned out um, and looked like a heart attack because the rush of adrenaline was so much that it's called stress-induced cardiomyopathy. The good news is those people usually recover within a couple months, but it is something that we see not very often, but again, that's usually from an acute stressor. Today's talk is really gonna be on the chronic stress. Next slide. Okay, so Socrates said long time ago that there is no illness of the body apart from the mind. And I'm gonna try to prove this to you. Okay, next slide. So let's start with what's a miracle. Everyone knows, but let's, let's what's the actual definition? So a definition of a miracle is an extraordinary event 
that is manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. Okay, but what is actually happening? So Dr. Kasdorf, this was like probably in the 1940s, 1950s, I want to say, um, was very interested in miracles. Go ahead. And wrote a book called Miracles. Next slide. And actually, go back. Sorry, let me explain that slide a little bit more. Okay, so what, so what he decided to do was kind of look through different stories. And he really just kind of published different miracles and put it out there. And so one I thought was kind of interesting when I looked through the book was... Um, so this was back, I want to say in the 1970s, and there was a female who was probably 30s or 40s who got diagnosed with a brain tumor. Now, um, this was back in the day where they didn't even really have CAT scans. The way they diagnosed it was doing like an angiogram. They put dye up into the brain, and then they, they scanned the brain that way. They didn't even have the MRIs or any of that back in the 70s. And pretty much when, because she was having headaches, this is why he looked, was looking. So he pretty much said, listen, you have a big brain tumor, um, kind of gather, you know, get your family together, get your affairs in order. Um, it's probably going to be a few weeks to maybe a month. Okay. So her family and extended family decided to do prayers like almost nonstop for 24 hours and maybe even longer. And the prayers kept going on throughout the next couple of weeks, this constant prayers for her. And within a month or so, she had a repeat angiogram and the tumor was almost gone. Now you could say, well, maybe that wasn't really a tumor. Maybe that was a fluke thing, or was it actually a miracle? And what does that mean? That means, you know, the thought is that somebody's or your own positive energy, positive thoughts, positive prayers actually can make a difference in the physical body, right? Like the thoughts can actually affect the physical body. So I'm just planting that seed. Okay, next slide. So everyone knows what the placebo effect is, right? We know that when you take a fake treatment, whether it's a salt pill or a sugar pill, a patient's conditions can actually improve simply because a person has the expectation it will be helpful. That's what the placebo effect is. So I'm gonna give you some examples of this and I just want you guys to start thinking about this. So Dr. Beecher, he was a pioneer in this. This was back in the fifties. He actually wrote, he kind of coined powerful placebo. He was the one who started thinking about this. And why did he do that? Because he was um, in World War I and during World War I, he found that um, he was a, one of the surgeons in World War I, and he found that they were running out of, you know, all these soldiers, they needed to do amputations, et cetera, and they were running out of morphine, but they had to do these amputations, et cetera. So he started, started it was, it was, he was so overwhelmed that he just started telling the nurses, just give them IV saline and just tell them that it's morphine so we can, you know, we can get done what we need to get done. And to his surprise, some of the soldiers were saying that their pain was better and they were able to go through the surgery. And again, they weren't getting morphine, they were getting saline water. Um, so that's where he was like, what, what is going on? How is this even possible? So that's why he got really interested in this placebo effect. And he started researching more and more and found that a third of patients that respond to treatment are actually responding to just a placebo. Next slide. What about more modern times? Okay, so the in New England Journal of Medicine, there was an article published. Um, it was not a big study, it was 180 patients, but this doctor, Dr. Mosley, took about patients with arthritis, right? He took a third patient of patients and actually took them into the operating room, cut their knee open and washed it out really good, okay? Sewed it back up. Then a third, another third of the patient, he actually went in there and kind of really debrided out some of the arthritis. The other third of patients literally got cut and got closed back up. So the patients, because they all had a scar, um, had no idea. And same with the physical therapists and the interviewers after that had no idea which third they were in because they all had scars. Now, all of them had the same anesthesia, same incision, all of them had the same physical therapy. And the result, all of three groups had the exact same outcome 
even up to two years with improvement after two years with getting all the same treatment. So again, did people think, okay, well, I had surgery, so I must be getting better. And just that thought itself made the difference? Maybe. Next slide. Okay, so those are more kind of subjective. My knee feels better. It doesn't feel better. I have pain. I don't have pain. What about objective data? We just talked about blood pressure and how it's important to measure it. So this study looked at vets, VA patients, and they were given either one of six blood pressure medicines or a placebo. And they found that 30% of patients who were given placebo, actually their blood pressure went down just because they thought that they were getting an actual medicine. And you can't fake, you all know, when you go to the doctor's office, no matter how hard you try, you cannot fake what your blood pressure is gonna be. Whatever that cuff shows, it's there. So isn't that incredible that 30% of patients' blood pressures actually came down given a sugar pill? And psychiatric meds, the placebo effect is even higher, almost up to 50%, if not higher, for um, the placebo effect in psych meds. Okay, next slide. So to me, and hopefully to you, I'm starting to slowly convince you that our minds and our thoughts definitely play a role between the miracles and the placebo effect that definitely there's something going on behind the mind and what we think and our thoughts and our body link. Next slide. Okay, so what is epigenetics? I mean, we all know what genetics are, right? Those are the genes. But epigenetics means control above the genes. So we all know that our cells, right, are controlled by DNA and the proteins that DNA makes proteins for our bodies. And we know that we're all born with the DNA that our parents gave us. But really, you know, what I tell people, just because you're born with that DNA, it does not mean necessarily those exact genes are going to get turned on in you. Now, if you do the same exact thing as your dad who had a heart attack in his 50s and his dad who had a heart attack in his 50s, then maybe. But if you have a different lifestyle, those genes might not necessarily get turned on in you. It just depends on what you're doing. And I'm going to explain that. Go ahead to the next slide. So we know in epigenetics that there's actually environmental factors like energy, the air we're breathing, the exercise we're doing, our mind, are we an optimist? Are we a pessimist? Our food that we're taking in, all of that actually has control over our genes. I think it's just incredible. And there's so many books now out there about epigenetics, about how there's this control above the genes, all of that inclusive, what I just said, the air we breathe, our stress levels, our exercising, our food, all of that can control the way our genes are expressed. And we actually know that during chronic stress, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, that our DNA actually gets shortened and twisted with chronic stress and more relaxed and anti-aging with positive, appreciative, and loving thoughts. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more. Next slide. Thank you. So we know that, you know, our genes don't necessarily, they don't make the decision about being turned off or on. You know, you think of genes as blueprints. They provide the potentials. And we know that our mind is really kind of the building contractor that adjusts the DNA blueprints, if that makes sense. It's our mind that's going to help not all, but it's partly to control what genes get turned off or on. Think of them as blueprints and think of the mind as the contractor. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, you know, if anyone likes to read about this, this book, Biology of Belief, Dr. Bruce Lipton is, is it's an amazing book. It's just a, it's really incredible. It's, it's about belief, but it's about like the science. If you're a nerdy science person, you want to read about the biology of how this all happens in more depth from what I'm saying. Um, that's a wonderful book to read. Um, and he even says what, you know, he says all of this, that only 10% of our health is due to our genes and 90% is due to our a lifestyle and our environment. Next slide. Okay, so the stress response. The stress response originally was coined back in the early 1900s. And, and Hans Selye, basically, he's a father of stress research. He, he developed the theory that stress 
is a major cause of disease because chronic stress causes long-term chemical changes. Now, remember, this is way before they had a lot of the medical technology um, we have now. And he is just observed, just from observations. Back then, they didn't do, couldn't do a lot of testing and experiments. He could just do observations that the body would respond to any external biological source of stress with a predictable pattern in an attempt to restore the body's internal homeostasis. Okay, next slide. So we know that the amygdala, okay, it's like a kind of an almond-sized organ that sits kind of in the back of our brain. It works as the emotional gauge and helps us determine if the fight or flight response will be initiated. So for example, you know, if someone's breaking into your home, right? That's when the amygdala, that's when you just kind of go into, you know, everyone would imagine someone's breaking into your home and you're sleeping and you hear someone coming in that all of a sudden you're, I mean, you can't even control it, right? Your heart rate skyrockets. You might start sweating, start breathing heavy. We're not controlling those. We're not making our heart rate go up. That's the amygdala sensing the fear and then it going into that fight or flight mode. But if a, a dog, like a pit bull is chasing us down the street, right? Though that's when the amygdala, that's not the time we want to sit and like, think about it. And how do I feel about it? We want, we need to go. We don't, we don't have time to think about anything. We need our amygdala to do what it's designed to do. However, what happens over time, go ahead to the next slide. And what happens over time is that our amygdala, um, honestly kind of becomes, I hate to use the term, but like not dumb is not the right term, but it just gets kind of muted down. It cannot tell, um, like if someone is in line in front of us, right? And we're in a rush and that person forgot their wallet. And now we just already put all our groceries on the thing. We can't even put them back in the cart. And now we just realize that we're gonna be even later, right? So our amygdala doesn't say, okay, well, wait a minute. There's no one breaking into the house. Um, you know, there's, there's no tiger chasing us down the street. Let's calm down. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not smart enough to figure that out because it's gone through this so many times. All it senses is, wait a minute, this is the time that I need to, I feel, I feel that emotion. It's time to get going. And it might not do the highest level, like someone breaking into your house, but you might get to here instead of here. Okay. And it starts secreting those same hormones and chemicals that we're going to go into. And that's when we, you know, we, have you ever had that knee jerk response where later on you're like, why did I even get so mad? Like, I don't even know why I got so mad. You get triggered that term triggered. Um, it's because our brain over years and years, I mean, really they say up at, by the time you're six, you've already developed nine your wiring. I mean, that's crazy to me. That means basically when you're young, if something happens, we, we wouldn't even remember. Our subconscious has already made those wires of what this response will be. So if someone told us we're eating too much, maybe as a kid, we might, as an adult, if someone tells us, hey, don't have that piece of cake, we might get triggered to being mad or something. So it's hard to break those wirings. It's hard to break those knee-jerk responses. It's not impossible and it takes work. Next slide. So what actually happens? So when the amygdala starts, you know, starts sensing all of this, whether it's being angry or anxious or depressed, it starts secreting hormones. It starts secreting adrenaline. What does adrenaline do? Adrenaline constricts vessels, right? We've all gotten red in the face when we're very angry or upset, increases our heart rate. It increases gastric juices. Has anyone ever had like an upset stomach when they're very stressed? It makes you gain weight because cortisol goes up. Cortisol is like steroid. So it makes you gain weight right around the belly, increases sugar, increases inflammation. And then again, back to that DNA, shortens and twists the DNA and makes aging accelerate. So that's all that's happening. Imagine just throughout the day, throughout the weeks, throughout the months, throughout the years, as we go up and down and up and down with different things in life, these are the hormones and um, responses that we're getting. Next slide. Um, and we kind of talked about this already. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So what are some signs of chronic stress? 
you know, you're losing focus, you can't sleep, you're getting angry easily. And then again, as you can imagine with everything I just said, with the adrenaline and the cortisol seeping through your body over the years, then you start getting the physical body changes. You can have coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, all of the cancers, inflammation, all of that can slowly, slowly come up with chronic stress because it's also causing chronic inflammation. Okay, next slide. And this is a, was an interesting study. They actually looked at anger specifically and they and they they had people kind of do this whole anger scale. If you want to look up the study, you can see what it was, what the actual anger scale was, but they followed them for quite a few years. And they found that people in the highest group in this anger scale had three times the amount of heart attacks um, and issues with their heart than the lowest group, irrespective of whether they had diabetes or a smoker or high cholesterol. Okay, next slide. Oh yeah, so here's a scale. Um, and I don't remember the scoring system for this. Um, if you got maybe a point for each one, but it's very interesting, you know, to kind of see where do you fall on here? Do you have most of these? That's you're probably on the higher end. You have only one or two. Um, you know, our, our, obviously we want to strive for having none of these. Um, next slide. What about depression? So we know that it's kind of goes two ways. So people who've had a heart attack or stent or bypass are more, more likely to be depressed. And patients who are depressed are more likely to have heart disease. So it's kind of goes both ways. Um, so again, it's something you want to address. You know, if you have depression, address it with your doctor. See who can help you. See how you can get help. If you've had a stent, if you've had bypass and all your medicines are fine, everything else is fine, but you have depression, address it because it's, it's a normal part of having heart disease. Next slide. Okay, so now I told you all the scary stuff and all the bad stuff about stress. What, what is the opposite response? Okay, the opposite response is a relaxation response. It's when the feel-good hormones are released. It's the endorphins, it's the dopamine. And what are those? Serotonin, all the stuff that our brain secretes. Some people take medicines for it, but our brain actually has these and, and, and can secrete them. What do they do? They dilate out the arteries instead of constricting them. They lower the inflammation. They help the immune system work better. They make the platelets not as sticky. They make the DNA um, better functioning and more anti-aging. So that's what we're kind of trying to strive for. Next slide. And it's not about necessarily getting rid of stress. Okay. So a lot of people are like, why, well, how do I get rid of stress? It's, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's very rare that people can just get rid of stress, right? Most people, no matter where you are in life, you're going to have some sort of stressor around you, whether it's kids, work, very hard to get rid of those kind of things. It, sometimes, sometimes if it's a terrible boss or a terrible friend, you know, maybe those things need to be addressed. But for the most part, most of us cannot take away the things that are causing us stress. So it's about balance. Okay. So I always tell people, let's work on balance. So how do we not, this is stress. How do we raise this or kind of bring this one down a little bit or raise this? So how do we decrease the stress response? So I want to, I think I'm okay on time. Let me give you just five more minutes of talking. And then I know we're trying to open it up to questions. So this is just a great technique. And I just want to talk about it real briefly. So if this book is from Martin Segelman, Learned Optimism, awesome book. Um, this is just one piece of that book. So it's a great book if you want to learn more about this. But basically, basically it's called the ABC technique. Okay, so A is the adverse event right? It's the thing that happened outside. B is the belief about that. And C is a consequence based on that belief. Now, the only thing that's actually changeable in this whole thing is that B. For example, let's say we're back at that Publix line running late. Um, the A is that person in front of you forgot their wallet, right? Can you control that? No. I mean, really, most of the stuff you cannot control about what's happening outside of you, people driving badly, you know, your parents getting sicker, your child not listening. Those are hard things to really control. We know with COVID, we can't really have much control over anything. So A is that 99% of A is on, it's not in our hands. 
B, on the other hand, is 100% in our hand. So for example, if I was this kind of person, my B of that person in Publix, I could be mad, angry, just like frustrated, huffing and puffing, like the blood pressure's going up. And I'm just like, just stomping around. And, and what do you think's happening? I mean, my adrenaline's going bananas, my cortisol's going bananas, everything's is just getting jacked up, right? And I might even carry it forward. Maybe the next person I see, I'll be ruder to them. We're just going to keep passing that forward. And guess what the consequence is going to be because of that belief, that belief of, look at this person. People are so organized in life, unorganized in life. I always get this problem. It's always my bad luck, you know, blah, 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 all that stuff. The consequence is anger, frustration, high blood pressure, red in the face, all those chemical hormones. On the other hand, what if my belief was, you know what? I really feel for this person. That must be terrible for them that they forgot their wallet. I'm just going to hang out here, get on my phone, you know, maybe play a game, maybe do some deep breathing. This was meant to be. I'm just going to chill out. Well, guess what? That consequence of that person, I mean, they didn't raise their blood pressure. They didn't have a huge adrenaline shove out the door. They didn't have anything. If anything, maybe they, if they were kind to that person, they actually secreted dopamine and serotonin. So the B is huge. So I tell people, make, make a diary of an ABC for just a day. See, see what's going on. See how many ABCs you have. See if you can start working on changing the B, okay? Meditation, you know, meditation doesn't have to be a whole big woo-woo thing. It can be multiple things. It can be deep breathing, having a mantra, slowly breathing in, slowly breathing out. There's tons of apps out there. Meditation is over and over and over again been shown to secrete all those happy hormones. Even if you do it for 10 minutes a day, five minutes for a day, one minute a day, just start doing it. Socially being connected is huge. We've obviously, you know, with COVID, we've been away from that. We need to get back to that. They've seen studies where someone just smiled at somebody else and you're secreting happy hormones and it's free. Um, so kindness, gratitude. I have, I personally write in a gratitude journal in the morning, or I just think of three things before I get out of bed. I force myself to thinking of three things that I'm grateful for that day before I even start my breathing or getting on with the day. I want to start my day like that. It's a great way to start your day. Um, and find what you love to do. If you love to knit, if you love to dance, if you like to walk on the beach, find what you love to do and make time for it. You might not have time every day, maybe once a week. You say, you know what? This is my day. I'm going to do it. That self-care thing. What is self-care? Only you and us as individuals can make that time for ourselves to have that relaxation response get higher up. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to get into this. We talk meditation. This is a great slide. Just real quick. They followed patients for about five years who meditated and didn't meditate. Pa patients who meditated had 50% less heart attacks and strokes. No medications do that. Next slide. Uh, keep going. I know we're, um, this is just a great, you guys can screenshot this or take a picture of it. This is a great book called radical forgiveness. Another good book is Forgive for Good. It's about forgiving, letting go, not holding on to things in our heart. Um, the gratitude journal we talked about. Next slide. Keep going. Okay, exercise. Exercise we know is good for the physical body, but it's actually really good for the mental body. It's excellent for stress. It's excellent for depression. It's good for lowering your blood pressure. Yoga, Tai Chi, any sort of exercise is great for just centering yourself. Next slide. Um, there are some natural treatments for lowering stress. Magnesium is probably one of my favorite minerals. Um, you want to get the right form. I have, I think my blog is at the end of this. Um, I have a whole article on magnesium and what kind to get. You take it at bedtime. It's a calmer, helps you sleep. It's good for chronic stress. Um, L-theanine is like Xanax, but it's completely natural. So you can take 200 milligrams as needed if you're just having a bad day. Some of my patients just take it twice a day because they just like that feeling of being a little bit um, relaxed. Next slide. Keep going. Okay. And yeah, so this I just thought was important to say, you know, I have a lot of patients who they associate themselves with their disease, you know, and it's, you got to remember, it's much more, it's 
just because you have diabetes or you have high blood pressure, you're not that, right? So you can actually change some of those things by remember that whole mind, how powerful our mind is. Next slide. Um, go ahead, next slide. You know, and again, this goes back to just kindness, smiling at someone, smiling at a stranger, giving a, a helping hand, all those things release those oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, which are also good for us. Next slide. That's my blog. I have a lot of information on my blog for heart health, holistic health, vitamin supplements, meditation, um, just stress responses, diets. It's all about holistic. Um, and if you sign up, if I write a future article, it'll pop up in your inbox. So sorry, I went a little bit over, but, um, but that's it. No, your timing was actually perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for providing us uh, with such relevant and timely information. I know many of us, um, including myself, uh, will be able to take this information and use it immediately. Um, and I will also be sharing your blog uh, on tomorrow with our audience. So definitely we'll make sure that they uh, have access to that. Um, so now we've arrived at our Q&A segment. So we're going to um, check the chat. Um, I didn't see that anybody had put uh, questions in the chat as of yet, but um, I'm going to, because I had a few questions of my own, <laughs> I'm going okay. to start with my questions. And if, again, if you have questions that you would like to place in the chat, please do so. Also, if you want to ask your questions directly, um, I can also unmute your microphone. Eric, I'm sorry. I can um, allow you to unmute your microphone and you can ask the questions um, directly. So my first question is, um, are there any mental health disorders uh, that are related to heart disease? Yeah, so I had that whole slide on depression. And so depression is one of those that are definitely linked. You know, like I said, if you've had a stent or heart disease or bypass, you're more likely to have depression. And if you have depression, you're more likely to having cardiovascular disease. Um, so definitely, and you know, I see depression is probably the biggest one. Um, anxiety and st chronic stress can also cause heart disease um, in a little bit of a different way than depression, just with chronic anxiety and panic attacks. And those, it's more of a sensation of chest pain, palpitations, and you might be have you might be thinking you're having a heart attack, but it's actually a panic attack. Um, but again, that's your way of your body saying something's wrong, the adrenaline's high, the cortisol's high. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes perfect sense. Um, and my ne next question is, um, I know that you mentioned um, like natural treatments yeah. um, that would help with your stress, but are there any foods that we can incorporate in, into our diet that um, will help to relieve stress naturally? Yeah, great, great question. So we know that there's actually... You know, the foods that are good for the heart, we always talk about Mediterranean lifestyle, healthy carbs, uh, you know, fruits and veggies. So those have all natural antioxidants and they just make you feel better, right? When you're eating healthier, eating whole foods, there have been enough studies to show us when we're eating kind of processed foods, um, high sugar foods, it, it just kind of jacks you up, if you want to say, and kind of increases a lot of the cortisol, increases the adrenaline. Our insulin levels, when we eat a high carb, fatty, like McDonald's meal or something, spikes, and then it goes down, and it spikes, and it goes down. Mm -hmm. So that can definitely play on to um, stress and anxiety, for sure. Drinking a ton of sodas instead of water, not hydrating ourselves, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I'll definitely have to watch that, especially the Mickey D's. <laughs> okay, um, next question is, how can you, and, and you had talked about this in one of your examples, but um, if you can answer, how can you tell if you are experiencing anxiety or heart problems? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, really, I always say if you're having any, if you're ever worried or concerned, go see your doctor. I mean, there's no point in trying to, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's probably fine. It's maybe mm -hmm. it's not. I've seen, I've seen it all. I've seen some mm -hmm. patients who are truly having a panic attack mm -hmm. and it's not their heart. But then I've seen some people who 
they're having like atrial fibrillation. They, they're having racing and they're like, oh, it's just a panic attack, but they're mm-hmm. actually having an arrhythmia or mm-hmm. they're actually having a heart attack. So I would feel much more comfortable with someone getting an EKG, getting checked out and knowing. But because sometimes a, a full on panic attack can feel like a heart attack, a squeezing in your chest, mm-hmm. you know, short of breath, you're getting hot, you're getting sweaty. Um, but I will say most of the time, you know, when you're, if you're having coronary artery disease, usually you're, it's a kind of, it's a tightness, like a panic attack can be, but it's usually exertional. Like, Hey, I walked a block and I had this weird, heavy symptom, Mm -hmm. very short of breath. Again, a panic attack. If some, some of those of you who've had that will say, well, I felt that same thing. And it was a panic Mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it, it can be extremely hard to differentiate, but, but that being said, if you've had a full workup, and everything has been cleared out, Mm -hmm. then probably every, if you're having a lot of chest pain and palpitations and anxiety, Mm -hmm. then it sounds like that really needs to be addressed, especially if you've had the whole heart work up. Okay. Thank you for that. And then um, another question, Um, can stress cause a heart attack or heart failure? Can stress uh, get to that level where it could actually cause. Yeah. So remember we talked about that um, broken heart syndrome in the beginning, yes. the Sobo cardiomyopathy. So yeah, so that's essentially what's happening. So mm. what I, what I was talking about today was kind of chronic stress and that can mm. lead to building up more and more and more slowly plaque buildup that mm-hmm. can eventually cause a heart attack, but the acute stressor, that's what I mean by the full adrenaline mm-hmm. and people come in and they have the stress, broken heart syndrome, stress induced cardiomyopathy can cause heart failure, all of it. And it doesn't mean you actually had a heart attack because when we do angiograms on those patients, Mm -hmm. they they usually have crystal clear arteries. Mm -hmm. It's just the arteries have spasmed down so much. Remember I talked about what adrenaline does, but there was such an extreme amount of adrenaline that it spasmed down so much and caused a heart attack looking like thing and heart failure. The good news on that one is usually that reverses not, I, I really have very rarely seen someone with that, that has not reversed completely and ha- normalized their heart function in a few months. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So it's very reversible, but it looks and feels and everything looks like a heart attack with okay. that acute one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I believe we do have, no, we have Ms. Tarsha Bell, who's just saying, thank you so much for the information. Is there anyone else who has any questions, again, I can unmute your microphone if you just press the raise hand icon on the bottom. Give it a minute. Oh, oh, okay. We have someone who raised their hand. Okay, you can go ahead on and unmute yourself. Let's see. Hi, thank you. This is Meredith Smith. Um, I'm uh, actually work with a nonprofit in Jacksonville called We Care Jacks. Okay. And um, thank you, Dr. Shaw, for this presentation. Uh, This we deal. uh, Our organization deals with patients who um, are uninsured and living with low or no income. And I've seen some studies and relationships of. childhood trauma and people who grew up with adverse childhood uh, um, experiences. Mm -hmm. Do you know how ACE scores um, relate to heart disease? I don't, I'm not familiar with what an ACE score is specifically. Oh, okay. Um, But I do, I mean, there's been tons of studies that show about childhood trauma and um, disconnected parents and divorced parents and, you know, just all that kind of stuff and how that plays into not just even coronary disease, but even cancers and inflammation, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, remember what I was talking about, how some of those, um, that subconscious is almost formed by the time you're six, Mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine if you've had trauma up until you were six, your whole life, you know, you can just imagine what kind of wirings you have, what kind of knee jerks you have, like what kind of triggers you have and Mm -hmm. how often those hormones are getting released chronically in you. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's definitely, and I'm sure that patient population is very hard to treat as well. Right. Because, you know, unfortunately a lot of the treatments we have, you need money and you need insurance and, and it's just unfortunate. I, I always drives me crazy that our insurance companies, 
um, would rather pay for Xanax and and those kind and Ambien and those kind of meds, but they won't pay for meditation or acupuncture or hypnotherapy. You know those kind of treatments that can actually help people get to the root of the issue. That's where I, I had hypnotherapy on one of my slides, but hypnotherapy is one of the ways that um, can actually get into that subconscious, um, you know, form that has formed and try to break those break those barriers. But I don't normally do like the ACE. That's kind of beyond my scope to being a cardiologist, but um, I'm sure there are studies out there, but I can just imagine with, um, you know, with all of that, with childhood trauma, for sure. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have Miss Sandra Scott raised her hand. Please feel free to unmute your microphone. You can go ahead. Okay, there you go. Okay, okay. It just popped up. <laughs> this is hello. Can you hear me? Hi yes. Hi yeah, we can hear you. Hi, fine. this is Sandra Scott. This is such a great meeting. Um, I've been from diabetic to now I'm pre-diabetic. Good. And determine how do you determine if you have a heart disease? Is That's that great. EKG? Does the EKG does that for you, or I don't know? Yep. What do you do? Yep. So yeah. So great question. So um. So first of all, yeah, EKG is always a great something to start off with. You know, it's mm -hmm. a basic test. It's, it, you know, that's easy to do. But again, but the EKG shows some things. It'll show if you've had a heart attack. It'll show if you have an arrhythmia. It'll show if you have a high, high blood pressure, but it doesn't show the whole picture. So EKG is basic. What I always like to get in some of my patients is what's called a calcium score. Um, and what that is, is a CAT scan that actually looks at plaque buildup. So a stress test, if, if you do end up having a stress test, um, that really only shows positive if you have a severe blockage. So, you know, cause we don't really do stents on heart arteries unless someone's having a heart attack, obviously. But if, if we go in, let's say, and we're looking at a heart artery and someone's having some chest pain, unless mm -hmm. their blocked artery is 70, 80, 90%, we don't really put stents in. So the stress tests are really only show up most of the time positive if, you have a severe blockage. Well, that leaves a lot of unanswered questions. What if you have some blockage and you don't know how aggressive to be with your diabetes and your diet and your cholesterol and your blood pressure? That's where that calcium score comes into play. So it's a CAT scan, no dye, very little radiation, kind of spits out a number. Zero is no hard plaque and above 400 is a lot of hard plaque. And then in between is kind of graded to your age. I usually don't start doing them unless a patient's mm, probably 35-ish and I quit doing them when the patient's about probably between 75 and 80. Now, if you've had a heart attack or stent or bypass, it's a waste of time because this test is designed to see, do you have any blockage in the beginning? So if you've already had a stent or a heart attack or bypass, we already know you have blockage. So there's no point, it's kind of doing a backward test. So does that answer your question? A calcium score is, is a great test to find out if you have any, any blockage at all. Is that calcium score, is that based on a blood test that the doctor no, it's, gives No, it's a CAT scan, it's a CT scan. Oh, it's a CAT scan. Yeah, okay. it's a CAT scan. Yeah, like that's why I said it's very little radiation. There's no dye. It's just it's a quick scan basically of the heart and kind of okay. gives you a number of how, what's going on. And I've, right. I've, I've seen some people who you would be shocked. I mean, they're like runners or healthy eaters and their calcium score comes back through the roof. And I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that we have that because before all we had was a stress test and you're like, well, your stress test was fine. You're probably fine. But lo and behold, they have like, you know, a blockage that's maybe 40, mm -hmm. 50%, that's not going to act up. You're not going to have any symptoms, but you want to know so mm -hmm. that you can start treating that. Is that done by the um, primary physicians? So I've seen some primaries do it and most cardiologists order it. And some primaries, I have some primaries who do order it on a regular basis and some primaries who don't. So it just kind of depends on you. You could probably ask your primary okay. to order it. And yeah, yes. just say, hey, I want a CT calcium score. I mean, Baptist does it. We do it at beaches. Mm -hmm. We do it at South. We do it at downtown. Precision Imaging does it. It's about a hundred bucks out of pocket. So mm -hmm. well, insurance don't cover that? No. Oh, it does not. Thank you. Yeah. No Thank problem. you, Ms. Scott. All right. We have another hand raised, Ms. Patricia Harrison. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. 
All right. Um, you were just talking about calcium. I have a question for you. Okay. I, I diagnosed with osteoporosis. Okay. And of course, you know, the recommendation is, oh, I need to take calcium. But then if I'm taking calcium, is that not a risk factor that I'm putting more calcium in my body? So now, although I could potentially prevent um, more bone loss, but what am I doing to my heart? <laughs> yeah. So I don't have any of my patients on oral calcium because of that. So really, you know, there's been enough studies for me where calcium, I like certain supplements and vitamins, but calcium is one that I, I usually don't recommend for my patients to take in the oral form. Now, dietary calcium is, is actually beneficial for heart health as opposed to supplemental calcium. And what I tell patients is, is a couple things. One, it's not that hard to get enough calcium in your diet, right? Unless I have very few patients where they're not having any dairy or any greens or they're not eating anything with calcium in it. In that case, I'll, I'll talk about what I do in that case. But most of the time, you know, if you have some yogurt, you have a little bit of cheese, you have some greens, you can get enough calcium. What's more important than the calcium is vitamin D, it's vitamin K2, and it's magnesium. Those three things actually help keep calcium where you want it in your bones and away from your heart. So if I have a patient that's like, listen, I don't have any calcium. I don't eat anything with calcium. I'm like, fine, get calcium, you know, get maybe like oyster shell calcium instead of citricol or, you know, whatever that is. Um, and make sure you get K2. So K2, not K1, K2 is what helps keep calcium in the bones and away from the heart. A lot of companies now are making D3 and K2 together um, because I know you need both for bone health. But again, you want to make sure you get your D3 levels checked because D3 is fat soluble. So I just had a patient today, their D3 levels were 130. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how much D are you taking? And they're like, oh, I just thought I could take as much as I want. I'm like, no, you can't. Um, so, you know, always get your levels checked and make sure you're on the right dose of the D3 because you can overdo it and you will not urinate it out. K2 is the same thing. We don't really check levels of K2. I usually put people on about 90 to 100 micrograms. I actually have a whole blog on this specific thing. It's on mm -hmm. what helps the heart, helps the bones. It's on D3, it's on K2, it's on calcium and all of that stuff. So if you want more information, even just go on that whole article. But yes, I don't put people on calcium 99% of the time. I tell them to get off of it, actually. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ms. Harrison, for your question. Uh, we have a qu another question um, in the Q&A. It's uh, Ms. Jude Perez. She wants to know the significance of carotid neck ultrasound in relation to heart disease and will it yeah. show? Yeah, so that's a great question. So carotid artery, we used to, that's what we used to do kind of a little bit more before we had calcium scores. We would check the animal media thickness of the carotid lining. And there was a great correlation between that and heart disease. The problem is a lot of insurance companies won't cover carotids. Like all day long, we used to try to order it and they say, nope, unless they actually have known blockage or stroke or whatever, which is why now, most of us just get the calcium scores. If you have plaque buildup here, whether it's in your neck or here, I mean, I mean, all arteries are kind of the same. We're treating all the arteries the same. And the calcium scores we know are out of pocket, like 80 bucks, 90 bucks, as opposed mm -hmm. to the carotid ultrasound, which could run you up to maybe three, $400, maybe even more, who knows? Mm -hmm. But yes, if you can get it covered, then a carotid IMT is great. I personally still, if I had to pick between this and the calcium score, I would still go with the calcium score just because I can look at the plaque buildup. Um, if you can get both, that's even better. Dr. Shaw, thank you so much again for um, such an informative presentation on tonight. Um, just want to share some very brief closing announcements before we uh, part ways. Uh, there will be an electronic takeaway handout uh, emailed on tomorrow that will include Dr. Shaw's blog information. Uh, so we want to make sure that you get that. Um, there will also be a very brief survey for tonight's session um, that we will be sharing. Um, so we ask that you please, please, please uh, participate in that survey. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, next month, um, before I end this, can you see my screen? Am I sharing my screen? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, 
Next month, will we be back here again to discuss the topic of caregiver self-care? Uh, Ms. Rachel Weinstein with Elder Source. Um, Elder Source is one of our trusted community partners. Uh, she will be our guest speaker. So if there are any caregivers or if you know of any caregivers, please, uh, when you see the invitation to register for uh, next month's session, please share this because there is a wealth of information, not only for uh, caregivers, but also for our senior community. So you definitely want to make sure that you are in attendance for next month's session. Um, please be on the look out for that. And all are welcome. Um, also, please take a note of the future sessions that we have lined up for, uh, let me see here, through the spring, through June. So please take a screenshot of this if you need to. Uh, I'll also be sending this out tomorrow. So that ends tonight's session. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you next month. Please spread the word. Good night, everyone. Thank you.